speaking with uh, Professor Jack Snyder, who is assistant professor at College of the Holy Cross uh, in Massachusetts, uh, and a historian and author on a wide range of uh, bringing historical perspective to a wide range of, of topics. Um, he is a graduate of Stanford University and teaches courses in urban education, research, schooling in the U.S., and historical perspectives, among others. Um, so thank you very much for taking time to uh, to chat this morning. Sure. So I want to start out, as, as we had, had discussed a little bit, just to kind of get us going. Um, the intent of this series, as you know, is to... Is to is to uh, connect folks who've been looking at the history around education uh, uh, with a wider audience of, of folks who are trying to figure out what to do. Um, and so uh, let me start out with uh, sort of a headline kind of question. Uh, as you think about the, the work you've been doing and, and what you've been gleaning from looking at the historical record, um, what is it that folks who don't know that record uh, ought to be made aware of? What are the kinds of things that you take away from that? Uh, in terms of current work. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking about that question. I've been thinking about what the, what the lessons are for reformers um, in the historical record. Uh, so a lot of my work is on the history of school reform, um, providing a historical uh, context for current policy issues. And I think there are really three big lessons. I mean, there are a hundred lessons, but I think <laughs> there are three really big lessons. Um, I, think, I think the first of those lessons is that reform never delivers as promised. Um, and so, of course, that, that begs the question, why? Why does reform never deliver as promised? And the first reason for that is that reformers are always trying to work on a grand scale. Um, and that happens not to work very well in education. Um, they want to find what works everywhere. And of course, we've got something like 13,000 school districts, you know, many more thousands of schools, three million teachers, uh, tens of millions of students um, in a very diverse country. Uh, and so nothing works everywhere. You want to find something that works everywhere? The answer is nothing. Um, and why is that? Well, it's because context matters in education. Um, and so if you want to work everywhere, you have to ignore context. And that gets you into trouble. So a great example of this from my work is the small schools movement, where the seeds of the idea in the work of folks like Debbie Meyer, if you go back and look at them, they're actually really nuanced and thoughtful about the importance of small schools. Debbie Meyer at one point in her work said that small schools are just a necessary precondition. It looks like you've frozen a little bit there, Mike. Can you hear me still? I can. Are we good? Yes. Can I pick it back up? No, I think okay. we're still hearing. All right. Yeah. So, um, all right. So Debbie Meyer says that, that small schools are a necessary precondition for all of the other work that needs to be done in a successful school. Um, and so she talks about the importance of democratic processes. She talks about the importance of connecting schools with communities. She talks about the importance of connecting teachers with each other, of building uh, what later would become known as professional learning communities. And of course, if you want to work everywhere, you can't say, well, do something democratic, right? Connect with the outside world in some way. The only instructive piece there is build a small school. Put no more than 400 kids in the building. And you can see that that actually wasn't the piece that mattered, right? So the results of the small schools movement were more or less disappointing. Yes, maybe they created the potential for more engagement. They created the potential for more relationships in some small schools. We saw those kinds of improvements, but we certainly didn't see the kind of systematic improvements that were expected, particularly in terms of academic gains. Why? Because of scale. Uh, another reason why reform never delivers as promised is because of the expectations that reformers set. So reform can often deliver something, it just doesn't deliver what was promised. Why is that? Well, reformers need to really oversell in order to rally support, right? They need to convince taxpayers, 
policymakers, school board members, teachers, that whatever their new thing is, is worth investing in. Of course, they've heard this many times before. And so reformers each time need to amp up the rhetoric a little bit more and say, you know, this is truly the thing that is going to solve all of our problems. Uh, and, and one of the big problems there is that they begin to believe their own rhetoric. They say this stuff over and over and over again. And so one great example of this from my work is Teach for America, where internally you begin to see some conversations at Teach for America. I looked at a lot of internal documents where they're saying things like, you know, wow, we, we may not actually be able to train a teacher in five weeks prior to the school year beginning. But there are mouthpieces at the organization who are absolutely bought into this message. And the message ends up being actually pretty damaging. Um, you know, if you look at TFA's work, they've gotten a lot better at training teachers over the years. But the message has been consistent and the message has been this so almost insane overpromise that by recruiting students with good GPAs uh, from prestigious institutions who majored in content disciplines, that you are somehow going to solve uh, the, the problem of not having you know, a great teacher in every classroom, that this is the civil rights issue of our generation. Um, and so when you set expectations like that, they are bound to fall short. Um, and then I would say the third reason why reform never delivers as promised would be that the ideas are flawed. Um, so reformers, of course, don't know this. They don't go into this process saying, you know, we've got kind of half an idea, but let's really <laughs> overpromise and then try to put it everywhere. Um, but of course, they work in an echo chamber, right? So one of the problems with reform is that we see reformers being drawn from a particular social class. They tend to be white. They tend to be from prestigious colleges and universities. They tend to then join the same sorts of institutions. They are networked through foundations and nonprofit organizations and government. It's the same uh, problem that Merle Curdy identified you know, over half a century ago in the social ideas of American educators, and we still see it today. Um, and in fact, Janelle Scott over at Berkeley has done some interesting research where she's just drawn network connections between actors, and you don't have to go very far to begin to connect most of the major players, right? So what you have here is an echo chamber, which is not a very good place to strengthen an idea, right? If you really want to strengthen an idea, you want it to be battered and bruised by every single stakeholder in the system. But that, of course, doesn't happen. And so an example of this, you know, one of the things that I've looked at a little bit in my work is charter schools. And the charter school theory of action is different at different charter schools, whether or not charter leaders recognize that. So some charters are working for one reason, others may be working for another reason, and many are failing. But of course, what charter school boosters will say is that charters work, period, full stop, end of story. Why? It's something about being anti-bureaucratic and having freedom. It's something about the market. But it turns out, in many cases, that's really not the issue. In some worst case scenarios, charters are working because they're just creaming the best students out of a district, right? So parents are self-selecting into this new school. You've already got students who are feeling special because they're in a school that perhaps required a lottery to get into. The charter can set higher standards because if they've got a waiting list, they know they won't be struggling uh, to, to produce tuition revenue. So um, all of this then means that the theory of action that reformers are using as their kind of North Star, uh, right, something about like take away regulation, um, you know, put accountability at the school level is not really what is driving improvement. Uh, you know, it's not always about creaming. Sometimes the charter school theory of action, it's working because the charter has become a very unique place where students who fit in that school have found a perfect match. Right? I think that's a kind of great story to tell in education. It's not just true at charter schools. It can also be true at traditional district schools, where schools have found a way to approach the relationships that really works for particular kinds of kids. 
Um, but of course, that's not what you hear. You hear that charters work, and as a result, of course, some of them will, many of them won't, and many will deliver uh, a product that is more or less the same as the traditional public school, the district mm -hmm. school. Um, so that, so that's that's my first big lesson: is that you know, reform never delivers as promised. The second big lesson would be, which is very similar, there are always unintended consequences of your reform. Mm -hmm. Again, begs the question, why? Well, first, because of the assumptions in the theory of action. Right? So there's always in a kind of implicit theory of action, if not explicit. Um, and as a result of the assumptions that you make, either you were right, you assumed the world worked a particular way, or you assumed that whatever you wanted to scale up was working at the small scale for a particular reason. Um, maybe you were right. Oftentimes, you are going to be wrong about part of that, and that will lead to unintended consequences. So an example of this from my work would be the Advanced Placement Program, where in the 1980s, we saw successful implementation of the Advanced Placement Program at a number of low-income schools. So the, the great example is Garfield High School, Jaime Escalante, Jay Matthews wrote a book about it. It eventually became the movie Stand and Deliver. The idea was at least this is what reformers thought. The idea was that if you put this better curriculum with the opportunity for students to earn college credit into every school, you would suddenly see the same kind of engagement and college matriculation that you were seeing in places like Garfield High School. The assumption was that it was something about the curriculum. Well, it turns out that that assumption was in many ways false. Right? A big part of why the AP program was working was that it, it was a high-status brand. It was only in places like Andover and Exeter and the Scarsdale Public Schools. Um, and so then when it was also in East Los Angeles, the kids in East LA were doing the same curriculum that students at Deerfield and Choate and I could go on and on naming fancy private schools they were doing the exact same kind of work, right? That not only in encouraged major student buy-in and teacher buy-in, but it also carried major weight with colleges and universities who were saying, wait a minute, these kids are absolutely as capable as their far more privileged peers. But when you bring it to scale, what you see is colleges and universities beginning to say, wait a minute, well, you know, this isn't Lake Wobegum, right? Stanford University can't admit every student who has taken AP classes because then they would have to double the size of their incoming freshman class. The signal power of having AP on your transcript was diluted. And of course, what that means is that the unintended consequence is that prestigious schools started dropping AP. Or they were using it for freshmen. So if you read like the Deerfield catalog, Deerfield says well, we, we encourage our freshmen to take AP courses, but of course, you know, we want our sophomores and juniors and seniors doing college level work. And as a result of that, the brand was weakened. You saw more colleges and universities moving away from AP. And as a result, it had less of an ability to motivate students, to motivate teachers, to inspire engagement, um, which isn't to say that the curriculum was entirely worthless. It wasn't in many ways. The AP program represents the strongest work being done at many high schools. But that was the whole story. And so you do see a lot of unintended consequences because the theory of action is flawed. Another reason you see unintended consequences is because of how reform is pursued. So this is something I alluded to in talking about Teach for America, but I think it's clearest when we talk about teacher evaluation reform. So reformers are pushing so hard right now to get value added as a part of a teacher's evaluation, that what they're doing is they're alienating teachers. And so there are going to be unintended consequences here with teacher pushback, with teachers undermining the work of reformers, right? And so it's not only that overselling will lead to underdelivering, but it's also that pushing so hard in a particular way can do something like alienate a constituency. Or for instance, the rhetoric of Teach America, right? Which can be quite damaging when TFA says, oh, you don't need teacher training, um, traditional licensure is a joke, 
Um, you know, we can train a teacher in five weeks. Teachers aren't that smart. What we need is, you know, students with uh, 4.0 GPAs from Harvard to be teaching students, right? That rhetoric can motivate and has motivated funders, um, support in state and federal government, um, partnerships with schools. But that rhetoric has also had the unintended consequence of stigmatizing TFA in certain circles or stigmatizing teachers who have been traditionally licensed fracturing relationships. So one of the things that I've seen in my own work is that Teach for America um, actually has learned a lot in terms of its training and does some training that is pretty worthwhile and that, that traditional colleges and university, uh, college and university teacher training programs could learn from and vice versa. Teach for America could learn a lot from uh, traditional teacher training at colleges and universities, but they can't learn from each other because they're now mortal enemies. Um, and so this is a, a factor in the structuring of unintended consequences. And then the third reason why I think you see these unintended consequences would be that reformers don't account for context. So we talked about this a little bit in terms of scale. Um, but what reformers never remember is that no matter what they do, there will always be mutation at the local level which will lead to unintended consequences. You cannot predict what will happen because, of course, you have so much autonomy at the school level. Right? Teachers still can always close their doors, even though we use tests to try to measure what they're doing and a standardized curriculum to try to control teacher activity in the classroom. Teachers still have the autonomy to close their doors and do what they want inside the classroom. Building leaders still have autonomy. Students have autonomy. Students who are compelled by law to be there are compelled to be there, but they are not compelled to be a certain way, right? And so a great example of this from the historical record would be decentralization, where you say, okay, decentralizing, devolving power down to the school level is going to be a good thing, right? The theory of action had to do with democracy and stakeholdership, ownership and buy-in. And of course, that's going to look wildly different at every single school because the stakeholders are different. The parents are going to want different things. Teachers will believe different things. The students will be a different sort of student body. The school leader will have whatever kind of personality he or she has. And so that reform showed a different face at almost every single school where it, it, it was implemented. Um, and so you see higher highs, lower lows. Um, you're, you're basically creating a structure for all of the differences that themselves. That was very unintended. Is um, this? It's the the biggest downer, but also the the uh, the optimistic piece, which is that real reform isn't sexy, and in fact, it isn't even really reform. Um, so when we think about why is reform sexy, why does everyone want to be a reformer? So I teach in the policy strand uh, here at Holy Cross. So there are students who want to study teacher, teaching and learning. There are students, students who want to study policy. Um, I did the same thing when I taught at Carleton College. And at schools like this, uh, what you see is the teaching and learning strand decreasing in enrollment, the policy strand increasing, really decreasing you know, at, at highly selective liberal arts colleges, probably the same at highly selective universities, is the teacher education program enrollment declining and declining and declining. Everybody wants to be a reformer, right? It's, it's sexy to be a reformer. Um, and in fact, at Stanford, where I taught as a graduate student, the business school has a joint degree program with the School of Education, where you have all of these students who want to transform education through business principles. I mean, these are like, these are the reformers' reformers. Why is reform sexy? Well, first, because it's smart, right? Because reformers are always saying, hey, it's not so hard, right? We've got an idea. We're going to solve the problem. Second, because it's brave, because they're saying, it's not so hard. Do you know what the problem is? The problem is politics, or the problem is bureaucracy, or the problem is, you know, intransigence on the part of teachers, or their unions, or the district, right? But we're going to be brave enough to tackle that head on. And then third, it's sexy because it's fast, right? No, it's not.
chat. Seem to have frozen here. When I was alluding to Merle Curdy's work um, about reformers coming from a kind of particular social milieu where reformers think this stuff because they're outsiders, right? As an outsider, it's quite possible to look at the educational system and say, hang on a second, it can't be that hard to fix this, right? It's a little bit like a business or... You know, maybe the answer is we just need to give more power to the stakeholder. Right? It's very easy to see simplicity as an outsider when you're not in the muck and the mire of our extremely complicated and complex system. Politics and obstacles, for instance, exist for a reason. They don't exist for no reason. So unions are often uh, defiant or oppositional towards reformers because they have a lot of experience, right? They've been down this road before. Maybe the reformers are new to this game, but the teachers aren't. The teachers have been here. The union leaders aren't. They've been through this before. And so while reform movements come and go, teachers don't usually, right? Schools don't. School leaders don't. Parents don't, right? A lot of the folks who you now see resisting testing, for instance, are being framed by reformers as you know, bullheaded and intransigent and stuck in the past. And particularly you hear they're concerned with adult interests. Well, yes, in part, that's true. It is an adult interest to not have your work transformed in a way that you think will be problematic for student learning and that will only make your own work more stressful and less rewarding. Um, and so it's easy as an outsider to dismiss that and say, well, that's just politics. Let's move beyond that. Um, and then in terms of speed, right, again, it's easy as an outsider to say, yeah, we want to do this as quickly as possible. But it's much harder as an insider to say that when you've seen things go too fast, when you've seen a curricular reform sweep through a school and half the teachers don't know why they're doing what they're doing or haven't received a training, where students don't even have the right books, where a principal is ostensibly an instructional leader but doesn't really have the time to observe every single teacher and hasn't himself or herself even been trained in whatever this new curriculum is. And so an example here is the Common Core, where, you know, the Common Core, from what I've seen of it, in many ways, is a strong set of standards. But the emphasis on speed is what people are getting uncomfortable with. And then the emphasis on testing is what people are feeling uncomfortable with. Show me the tests. Show me what my training is going to be. Tell me what I need to relearn here. And reformers, again, may chalk that up to politics. They may chalk it up to adult interests. But this is experience and insidership. And in fact, you know, the idea that being an insider is somehow a bad thing is ludicrous, right? If you look at the historical record, right, outsiders have never delivered an answer to the schools, that has then proven to make education better for everybody, right? Yes, they're brave, but they're often ignorant, right? Yes, they're smart, but they're often smart about the wrong stuff, right? They're smart about, you know, I forget what his name was, the, uh, the former superintendent of the LA schools who was a, an admiral in the Navy, right? I have no doubt that that guy could have marshaled ships to whatever port in Los Angeles he needed to, but he didn't know how to run schools. So the, the, the final piece of this, right, this lesson three, reform isn't sexy, it isn't even reform, is that change does happen, right? It isn't reform, it isn't sexy, but change does happen. Change happens over time. It looks a lot more like evolution, right? It doesn't happen quickly, it happens over decades. It doesn't happen through an easy process, through a simple answer. It happens because people put in the work. The system is huge, Right? We have a massive educational system. We're one of the largest countries in the world, and we promise to give every child an education. That's a great thing, but it's a complicated task. Right? People are also wedded to what they know. Right? Parents and students are wedded to the notion of real school. Mary Metz this concept of real school, what a real school is. And that limits how fast change can happen. Teachers are wedded to notions of real school. They're wedded to the lesson plans they've been using. Um, think back to Dan Lordy's concept of the apprenticeship of observation, right? Teachers are wedded to these practices that they were taught with by their teachers. 
So, you know, it takes time to evolve, to change. It takes time because interest groups are real and they can't be wished away, right? They, we have a, a democratic system. And if there are groups that have an interest in that system, and I'm not talking about interest groups that actually constitute a small number of human beings and a large number of dollars, but interest groups like teachers' unions, which constitute millions of human beings, human beings, or parents' organizations, which constitute tens of millions of human beings. Uh, you know, you, you can't wish those, those groups away. You can't wish their interests away. You can't tell them that they're wrong, because in fact, the system really belongs to them. And then, you know, finally, it takes time because, because people don't change overnight, right? So if you think about education as the work of human improvement, right? So David Cohen has written really beautifully about the challenge of teaching, is so difficult because teaching is the work of human improvement. Well, education is the work of human improvement. And learning how to promote learning, well, you know, that's like we've entered a kind of meta-complicated state here where that is going to take even longer. We need to, to have time to retrain people. Well, what are they going to be trained in? Well, we need time to think about that. You know, who's going to teach them? Well, we need time to train those people. And how are we going to train them? Well, we need time to think about that as well, right? We need to see practices on the ground. And those often need to spread organically. Um, we need to see experiments that then grow naturally. Um, we can't just bake up an idea in a lab that might work if we implemented it through the management structure of a McDonald's, where all we need to do is present you know, a bunch of frozen patties to a fry cook and a microwaver who are then going to engage in a kind of automated process, right? People have autonomy, people have interests, people carry personal histories with them. All of this takes time, but we know that it changes, right? We know that right now we have a fairer system than we've had at any time previously in American history. It's not fair. It's certainly not perfectly fair, but it's fairer. Right? In terms of school funding, we're not there yet, but we're a lot further down the line than we were 20, 50, 100, 200 years ago. Right? In terms of the curriculum that is taught, again, we're not there. But wow, I mean, go back in history. Look at a textbook from 1850. Your mind will be blown. Right? I don't want my kids learning from a book like that. Look at pedagogy 200 years ago. Right? Larry Cuban has written very persuasively that Teachers haven't really changed their practices that much over time, but they have changed their practices over time. And so do I want my kid learning by rote, focusing primarily on spelling and penmanship and religious study? No, I don't. Things change, and I'm glad they've changed. They change slowly. And in fact, they've, they've led us to a place where more or less, we all agree that our schools are good. And so despite the rhetoric of crisis, so this next book project I'm working on is an exploration of why, despite the fact that all we hear is that the schools are in crisis, you know, nothing, nothing is going to prevent you know, America from basically falling off the face of the earth and drifting off into space because our schools are so bad. Why is it then when parents are polled? that the overwhelming majority of them express very high levels of satisfaction with the schools their own children attend. They say, oh no, the nation's schools, the nation's schools are a basket case. But the school my kid attends is actually pretty good. Um, and I think that that's a this divide between the way reformers work and the reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground is that schools are pretty good. So that's what I got. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic! Oh, thank you. I I, I got a zillion follow-ups on on these things. So, but, but thank you. It's okay. funny that that piece on the, your current project on the schools in crisis that reminds me of. Uh, so I'm trying to do some work now on on uh, history around school choice, and one of the things that I find mm -hmm. hard to understand is that 20 years ago, parents, most parents, said they're sending their kids to the schools that were their first choice. Right. So, so, so what are we what are we doing? What are we talking about? <laughs> it becomes an interesting question historically if you start to say, actually, is this new or yeah. is this not? So I'll be interested to see right, what you right, come right. up with on the crisis. Right. Um, I also love the fact that you mentioned sort of what changes have happened because I think one of the interesting things that we sometimes don't, you know, it's the whole uh, Rip Van Winkle thing, you know, that if uh, um, 
you know, Rip Van Winkle were to awake, uh, uh, you know, and come into the current moment, you know, he'd be shocked at our hospitals mm -hmm. and so forth and so on, but he would recognize the school. Uh, right. And I think, as right. you're saying, if you really uh, talk about the, the fairness, the curriculum, the pedagogy and so forth, actually it's a, a very different place. Uh, but right. Was, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I think Rip Van Winkle would actually recognize hospitals, right? Be I mean, it's the exact same thing. Rip Van Winkle would see, oh, there are these people, they've got white coats on, there's a building, there are sick people who are being attended to, in the same way there's a school building, there are teachers, there are students, there are desks, right? But what is the medicine that is being administered, right? Medicine right. was being administered. It just happened to be, you know, the equivalent of bird seed or whatever right. it was. Right, right, um, right, right, so I, right, right. I think the same is often true in education. Yeah, yeah. So I want to. I want to. This is fascinating. Thank you. A uh, question I, I want to. That's uh, that's intrigued me, and and I'm uh, particularly going back to the work that you've done on on small schools, which I think is particularly interesting because you, uh, uh, in that in the wonderful book, sort of take things that people have chosen to want to scale. So I want to right. maybe push on that question of uh, what it is people want to scale. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think of, say, Debbie Meyer and Ted Sizer and the whole coalition effort, that was to say, uh, what we want to scale is a set of schools, if you will, that buy into this set of principles. And as you mentioned, yeah. that were democratic, that were, you know, sort of loosely termed uh, pedagogical progressives, uh, that were about engaging broader community, um, adjusting to individual learners, demonstrating authentic work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that they didn't presume yeah. that there was a model of the school to scale beyond that, even though over time a number of them started to borrow formats of what they did for student advisories and projects and schedules and so forth. I guess I'm trying to understand sort of how, you know, and yet now when we talk about scaling or in the sort of the post Bill Gates small school effort, uh, it was about scaling size. Uh, because of you know relevance relationships and so forth, um, right? How do we understand what shapes what we want to scale? Uh, and is that where some of this comes into play? I'm not exactly sure what I'm asking on it, uh, but I'm sort of trying to get at this notion that we seem to shift in what we, you know, uh, part sure. of what Meyer was looking for in terms of scaling is scaling like civil rights movement scaled, right. rather right. than your McDonald patties. <laughs> right. uh, scaled. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the answer is pretty pretty straightforward, and and that's that. Sorry, we were talking to each other there. I think the answer is pretty straightforward, and it's that some things are scalable and some things aren't. And the difference is that folks like Debbie Meyer recognized that even though they aren't scalable they are essential, right? The Coalition for Essential Schools was pushing to scale things that really can't be scaled. Um, that's why some of their work they acknowledged went too fast. They needed more years, and even they were working pretty slow for, uh, you know, at least in the world of reform. Um, whereas others took that idea and said, you know, we've got to drop off a bunch of the pieces that you've included here because, you know, there isn't the time, there isn't the manpower. The best example of this is the U.S. Department of Education, which said, okay, we'll back this small schools movement through our smaller learning communities grant. And they said, actually, there isn't the money to do this. So we can't even scale the building, right, just giving you a small building, what we'll do is we'll help you create schools within schools. So this is the ultimate watering down. This is, this is scaling what you can rather than scaling what you even dream might work, right? It's one thing to dream like, oh, well, this, you know, the smaller building will foster relationship. People will run into each other more. And you'd, you'd be wrong about a lot, right? There would be unintended consequences. Part of your theory of action would be wrong. But it's another thing entirely to say, well, we're not even doing what we think works. We're doing what we can do. Uh, and so the smaller learning community model was you just divide a large high school up into 
for smaller height. You know, it's usually one on each floor of the building. And folks like Debbie Meyer were outraged. I mean, she couldn't say enough bad stuff about the smaller learning communities uh, grant program and the idea of a school within a school. The line of hers that I remember is, a school within a school, whatever that is. Um, and so, you know, I think this, the, the idea that, you know, we must act is something I hear a lot among reformers or that I read a lot. We must act. And I think that's a big part of the problem, right? If you feel that you must act, then it causes you to act even in the face of evidence that may make you question your actions. It makes you act even when you realize that you're not even faithfully implementing the model that may or may not actually work because you haven't yet really looked at all the evidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As, as Payne up in Chicago would say, it's big on urgency and low on complexity. <laughs> I think it's one of the, the things you're underlying. Um, so tell me... Yeah. Um, right. The the uh, tell me more about how you're thinking about this question of pace because I, I I hear the you know you hear the same thing. I was just at a meeting last week where it was you know the urgency and the the um, uh, look reform you know the resist you know that that uh, interpreting what you talk about in terms of context and uh, the nuances and local. Uh, uh, unintended consequences and so forth, and people will say, yes, but my kid is only a fourth grader once, right? Um, and, um, you know, and, and part of what I think is always interesting in these things is that there seem to be lots of little partial truths on both sides of these different debates as they often get polarized, um, where you say, well, yeah, curriculum, quality of curriculum as an EAP situation does matter, sure. Just changing that would be something else. Actually, reminded me of an interesting. I full disclosure uh, was working at uh, AP <laughs> uh, 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 for a number of years, and uh, you're quite right. As soon as we pushed what was internally known as this equity agenda for AP, open access, right, uh, and in right. fact gave even tools to districts to identify uh, through use of PSAT and others larger pools of people. We did hear from those schools who said, well, maybe there's a way to do an AP diploma. Uh, that would be a sort of an AP plus kind of thing uh, that would distinguish. Mm. And, uh, and, and IB right. was very clear that what they did was they recruited those schools that already had strong AP programs, and that would be the branding, um, uh, the level above, whatever that was. Anyway, um, right. but this, mm. this, this question on, on um, PACE... Uh, it seems to me as long one, as well as as this question of the role, and I just sort of want to get your sense of the history on this. The and it seems that part of this is a question of uh, obviously the mixes of purposes that people have. So urgency about my kid, um, and again whether or not that, as you've indicated, there are from the historical record reasons to be cautious about mm -hmm. no matter what your sense of urgency is, the reality of what will happen. There's also, I guess, the sense of what it is that we want those institutions to do beyond just my kid. Um, and it seems to me that those are rather different agendas that are out there. Um, and that if we, to go back to the earlier in terms of the Debbie Meyer and the other examples versus uh, schools today, that those, the role of democratic purpose in all these seems to be very different. I'm wondering if that's something that you've, you've seen as well. Is that something that... Um, We've simply gotten tired of all those local democratic bodies uh, getting mucked up in things, and that maybe we ought to just move that aside. And uh, you know, we're not so democratic about hospitals. Uh, yeah. Maybe we don't need to be so democratic about schools. Yeah, right. <laughs> what would a historian say? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think um, you know. Uh, that the answer is, is ultimately one that isn't very satisfying, right? It, it's that you have to believe, what's the Fitzgerald quote about, you know, the sign of a genius is the ability to hold two contradictory ideas in your mind at the same time. Um, and you have to believe two things at once. You have to believe that, no, we are not going to transform the schools in one year or two years. I'm sorry, your fourth grader is not going to get an education that is substantively different than the fourth graders from, you know, five years ago. 
or the fourth graders five years from now. Um, on the one hand, you have to believe that because if you don't believe that and if you don't take that attitude, you're always going for the short-term win and the short-term win never works. Um, you know, Jeff Hennig's work shows us, you know, some of the problematic interplay between political cycles, which are always turning over, and education, where if education is subject to votes in the House of Representatives, for instance, right, or to mayoral elections if they're every two years, or maybe they're every four years, presidential elections every four years, that this can affect the nature of the policy debates that we're having. It can affect, affect the nature of the agenda. A governor who decides that he or she is going to be the education governor then only has a couple years to really show that. Um, so I think this attitude that, you know, we've got to turn it around. We could, the qu quote that, you know, you hear so often is, we can't lose a generation of children. You have to say, I mean, it, it, you know, it, you don't want to believe this, but you do have to, out of one side of your mouth, be able to say like, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're going to lose a generation of kids. Um, and, you know, when I say lose, you know, I think the schools are working right now. So you're not actually losing. They're just, that this generation of kids is not going to experience something that is radically different from what the previous generation experienced. Out of the other side of your mouth, you have to be saying exactly what reformers are saying, right? It has to happen now. There is great urgency. Um, we cannot lose a generation of kids. I think, you know, if you can hold those two ideas in tension, in, in tension with each other, um, that what you end up with is a kind of reasoned stance that we've got to do something. Right? And we can't say like, well, let's, let's foster you know, productive evolution. And 50 years from now, the schools will be you know, really terrific. Um, but at the same time, you can't say, you know, let's try to find a silver bullet and put that into play. Um, so I think you know, thinking about something like capacity building is not so different from thinking about you know, the building of a democratic community, thinking about teacher professional learning communities, right? These are ideas which you can put in place tomorrow. Now they're not going to start working tomorrow, but they'll start paying some dividends within the first few months, maybe a year. If there's actual follow through on these 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you'll see transformation. And so for me, holding those two ideas in tension with each other actually doesn't produce contradiction. It produces real reasonable policy where the short-term gains, you know, they're, they're significant in a kind of statistical sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then the long-term gains are significant in a, in a felt sense. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes a lot of sense. The, one of the things... Uh, if I can hold you on for a little bit longer, the, that sure. I've been intrigued by your work as well is that you um, you pay close attention to uh, some very kind of day to day practices uh, that teachers and others engage in, um, and um, history around grading or history around uh, Socratic method and and so forth. Um, and it's wonderful because it's often the the, the the, the nitty gritty of what people are doing day in and day out, and to try to to embed a bit of experience into those things that people recognize. Um, mm -hmm. And it's one thing to talk about shifts and progressive tensions and so forth. It's another to say, why do we do A to F? And what is that? <laughs> is that is that a body something hey. I want to be doing or not? I, I'm just wondering hey. at that level. A, I guess, it's just a, a, any thoughts you have on as you've looked at these very particular practices that are the the uh, the warp and woof of day to day existence and, and a lot of schooling, um, what you seem to glean from some of those practices. Uh, the, yep. the, uh, you've talked a little bit already about sort of some of the challenges of just changing those embedded things. Uh, and I love your reference back to Lordy's work on that. It just becomes this kind of embeddedness. Um, anyway, thoughts that you might have on how we understand that day to day work? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so for me, as somebody who's interested in 
policy and change, but who is also a historian and trying to take the long view on things. I think the most interesting binding of this is that if you dig deep enough, the answer for most of what we do in education is, well, that's kind of what we've always done, right? And so I think that cultivating a mindset among educators, and uh, you know, I'm using educators in the broad sense here, um, cultivating a mindset of questioning and of not simply accepting things, not accepting an idea. So, you know, my book, From the Ivory Tower uh, to the Schoolhouse, explored ideas that have moved from research into practice and why they've moved. And a big part of why they moved is they had a kind of brand cachet, right? That shouldn't be why ideas move, right? Why do teachers do what they believe to be the Socratic method? Well, you know, they've kind of seen it before. They've heard it. It's got a good name. It sounds like it's rooted in antiquity, which it really may or may not be. It probably isn't. Um, and so if we say why are we doing this, right? Is this really what we want to be doing? Does this make sense? Does this make sense for our kids? Does this make sense if I'm a school leader? Does this make sense for our teachers to be doing? Why do we give grades? I mean, that's a, it's a crazy thing to do when you think about it, right? You look at a piece of student work and you say, you know, A, B, C, D, let, we'll skip E, F, so there are five, I'm going to divide the world into five. I'm going to divide you into quintiles here. Oh, but we need like we need an A minus and B plus. And we there's a, the illusion of exactness there, right? I even give this grade the A minus slash B plus because I found <laughs> I was giving you know all these A minus and all these B pluses. You know because of course grade inflation is another real thing in the world. And, you know, the, the idea that I can pinpoint, you know, when I, if I translate that into a number, I translate it in my grade book as an 89.5. You know, it's like, I, it's like I'm a computer, right? I, I am so exact. I just kind of scan it with the lasers that are in my eyes. I read it uh, 89.6324. Uh, and so these practices, when you begin to really think about them, are kind of crazy. And I think some of the best schools have these cultures where they, they question everything. Why do we have a dress code? If we do have a dress code, what should it constitute? Why do we only have one teacher in each classroom? Should we have two? Should we have a paraprofessional in there? Should we have somebody who speaks another language in addition to English? Why is the teacher sitting in front? Should the teacher sit in back? Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm so critical of innovation for the most part, because mostly it isn't critical in the sense that I'm talking about, right? The idea of the flipped classroom, for instance, I think is a really cool innovation, but only if you say, hey, why, why is the teacher kind of like doing all this lecture stuff that students don't really like very much and are, are obviously bored by? Why is the teacher doing that in class? And then the place where students need all this help, why are they doing that alone at home? Right? That's a great question. But unless you are actually asking that question, then I think the flipped classroom is just a bunch of nonsense, right? Because a teacher is just going to implement it thoughtlessly because, you know, he or she has been told to or, you know, just believes that it's for some reason better. And then nothing will change as opposed to really interrogating the issue and saying, like, what do my students need? Why are they not? Why am I... Why am I saying what I'm saying? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I writing what I'm writing? Why is this assignment what I'm giving them? Why do I give assignments? Why am I grading the assignment? Um, and so my work on things like, you know, the history of grades, or I'm writing a, a paper right now with Ethan Hutt at the University of Maryland about the history of standardized tests, you know, and, and so, like, why, why do we give standardized tests, particularly in light of the fact that, uh, you know, so many people have problems with them? You know, that they, they don't really think they measure learning very Why do we continue to do that? And so I think that investigating these practices helps us remember that, uh, you know, the things that we take for granted as being, um, you know, almost like they were written on stone tablets and handed down to us are in fact just, you know, artifacts of the past. Um, that, you know, chance 
played a very major role mm-hmm. in um, in their winning of foothold in uh, in the structure of school or in the practices of teachers, and that um, and that you can change anything that you want to change. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's tremendous. I love that line about that. You're right. I think the uh, uh, what innovation. You know, somebody once said to me, "Well, if I flip the classroom and put the lecture online, um, does that become like the reading assignment?" Except you're not reading, you know, it's sort of like, how critical that's was right. that really, that process, that's all right. in all? Was it just I, like another it's, text? It's an audiovisual text, I guess. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and if a student has an audio book, is that sort of a, you know, I mean, sort yeah. of you don't, you really push the question very far. Um, well, I wish you, I think the, the, the question on the testing, as I was, I was uh, one of the other people in the series is going to be Bill Reese, who, as you know, did a book on, on this whole and uh, I was I was uh, relating to him something I came across in the archives of the College Board when they first made the shift from the or were thinking of uh, making the shift from the old sort of uh, blue book kinds of uh, testing that they were doing at the beginning to uh, some kind of you know this mental power tests that eventually became the the SAT and uh, uh, there was notes that somebody had the presence of mind to, to uh, keep at one of the early meetings when Brigham and some of the others first came in to introduce it. And the, and the response was that somehow somebody captured was, what are the psychologists doing here? What, what? <laughs> it's like, what? You, you, you don't know history. You don't know English right. literature, <laughs> calculus. What, right. what are you doing right. here? And I think that kind of critical sense right. of why, why are we doing this anyway is something that is right. is a is a great contribution to the kind of work that you're doing because it really does take things that are embedded uh, yeah. and raising that question. So um, anyway, so uh, very grateful for your your time. Very grateful for the work that you're doing, and um, appreciating you helping us share this out to a wider audience.